As I mentioned in my speech, the situation in the global food markets is deteriorating. And again, I want to emphasize, it's not our fault. Definitely not. It all started with the uh, skyrocketing inflation and pumping money supply and money printing by the leading economies in the European Union and uh, North America. They created this problem, and of course they made things even worse uh, with sanctions imposed against Russia, primarily the logistical problems, financial services, insurance. But we certainly wouldn't want anyone to suffer from hunger because of that. I've lately was meeting the representatives of the African Union. I told them and I want to assure them once again we're going to do everything possible on our side to take care of the interest of our regular buyers of grain. And by the way, lately we've been supplying grain to Kazakhstan as well. And we intend to do it this year as well. I've already mentioned this number, 50 million tons of grain we're going to have uh, this year. That is a serious volume. We are still leading in uh, volumes of sales of grain at the moment. We are number one in sales of grain in the world. But again, we are not happy at all, and we are not taking joy in any kind of negative consequences that might follow. We really hope that uh, finally our partners will come to their common sense, and the situation will come down, and everyone will start treating interests of their partners with respect, and will function normally. And I have no doubt that time will pass, and many of our partners from at least European countries will come back to the Russian market and will keep doing business here. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Life will force them to do that, and we will not stand in their way. We are open to the world, but they have to realize that you need to treat other people with respect. Um, I hope so. We were warmly welcomed by the president of China, and there are uh, different opinions on China among experts uh, on the region. One say that uh, some experts say that China is being careful that it will not extend a helping hand to us because it can damage uh, their interests. As an example, they say that Huawei shops are being closed in Russia. Others say that cooperation with Moscow corresponds to the core Chinese interests. Because the world uh, with uh, much weakened Russia gives uh, less hope to China uh, to hope for a multipolar world. In your opinion, what do you see? What will be with picture, the picture with China? And what is the situation? You know that multipolarity is not a preferred scenario. It is inevitable. And when we hear that some try to freeze the international relations uh, at the example of 30 years old when the 30 years ago when uh, the USSR collapsed but people understand that uh, the changes are inevitable we see a more dynamic uh, polaris uh, of power and many people don't like it and many people don't like uh, seeing the growth of Chinese might I highlight that uh, the economy on uh, PPP is uh, China is number one on, in this regard. And this is a fact, and GDP per capita is much lower in China than in the United States and Europe. But uh, taken into account the economy as a whole, China is number one. And given the growth tempos of China, it means that China can allocate massive resources to development 
to culture, education, science. It's, this is very important and this creates prospects for the development. The same applies to India with a population of about 1.5 billion people, market economy, it has been dynamically developing. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is a very uh, progressive man, a very smart man. Take, for example, Indonesia with a population of 300 million people. Uh, this is the largest uh, country with the largest share of Muslim population. It's also developing. Africa has been developing. Latin America has been developing. Yes, these regions have their problems, but everyone has problems. Uh, but the potential is colossal and it cannot be disregarded. The multipolar world is inevitable. And those who try to desperately preserve the unipolar world, they are making a terrible mistake that will be very costly to them. I have no doubt about it. It is not a threat. It's just a matter of life. This is a fact. As for the People's Republic of China and our relations with China and Asian countries, we have started uh, intensifying our cooperation not recently, but we have been doing it because Asia and China are the new centers for global development. Everyone understands it. Everyone sees it. Take a look at the GDP growth in China. Yes, it used to be 7 plus percent, now it's 5 percent. It was inevitable, this drop, but they are clearly leaders in this regard. The GDP growth in the United States was around 1.7 percent GDP, if I'm not mistaken. In the Eurozone, it was even lower. In Asia, the number was 5 percent or even more. So these are the global trends. And we are building our relations in line with these trends. We have been doing this for many years. Our trade turnover is 140 billion dollars and um, this year will see a record high number in terms of trade turnover not because the current political situation forces us to do it but it's about an objective global picture we are interested in cooperating with china it is beneficial to cooperate with china given that bilaterally we have very good trustful relations and personal friendly relations with uh, president xi and it uh, lays a um, good foundation for building interstate relations. However, it doesn't mean that China has to play up to everything we do, has to follow us in every endeavor. We don't need it. We understand that China has national interests, and we understand that, as we do, the Chinese leadership is guided, first and foremost, by their national interests. But our national interests do not contradict each other. And if we have some arguments, uh, and of course there are some issues issues that we do not share opinion on completely, but uh, on an interagency level we always find solutions and I'm confident that it will be the case in the future. You have just said and you have been saying this over many years about the entrepreneurial liberties liberties for doing business, and you are saying that this is the way forward for us, the way to development. This will be key in uh, overcoming these colossal sanctions that were destined to destroy us. And the president of Kazakhstan, Mr. Takayev, has recently said I quote, in a new just Kazakhstan, there must be no room for uh, corrupted um, judges and law enforcers, end of quote. I don't know what is the situation in Kazakhstan now, but uh, Mr. Putin, I regret to, I, I, I'm afraid that I will uh, disappoint you, but the situation in Russia in this regard with corruption is somewhat deplorable. Because the number of um, people sent uh, to 
uh, free trial uh, detention uh, centers, uh, the number of businessmen sent there is, uh, remains the same. So you know that in America uh, there is a deep state. We have an anti-state that doesn't listen to you and doesn't uh, respect uh, uh, the current legislation. This is deplorable. Maybe we can uh, adopt a tougher stance on it, for example, uh, to put it into, uh, to enshrine it into our legislation to forbid those uh, people being sent uh, to the pretrial detention centers. I think that those people who are sent there, they are less harmful than the system itself, because uh, the system protects the interests of uh, some unscrupulous people. This is a very sensitive matter. I have already mentioned it. And um, you have been speaking on behalf in the interest of uh, uh, businessmen. I understand these concerns. This is what I was talking about. This was the reason why I was talking about it. But there is the other side of the medal, the interests of people, of ordinary citizens. And if they see that uh, if uh, there are illegal violations, uh, the violations of the law uh, with regards to businessmen, then ordinary people think that uh, they ask themselves a question, why aren't state protecting us? So the situation is not easy here. You have just mentioned um, the fact that we are facing pressure. Uh, but let's go back to realities. Our neighbors also face such a pressure. Our partners saw uh, their property being taken away. They were punished uh, for working in Russia. Where are those principles of inviolability of uh, private assets? Sanctions hit hard against uh, people who have absolutely nothing to do with uh, the state, have absolutely nothing to do with the decision making. Those are the physical persons who were working in good faith and they didn't violate uh, any legislation, not uh, in Russia, neither in uh, other states. This goes beyond uh, uh, every single rule. This is insane. And many people who, who were part of the Western economies, uh, they uh, they were in favor of developing relations, but then when they were taken everything, when they saw their assets being taken, uh, they were really offended. And in 2014, you said that they will feel the consequences. Unfortunately, this was the case. But there is nothing like that in our country. Yes, uh, there are problems. Otherwise, I wouldn't have raised this topic. And facing today's difficulties uh, with regards to the pressure from the outside, I constantly repeat, we can respond effectively only by increasing liberties uh, of our ordinary citizens. And it applies to the law enforcers also. The law it means that uh, this criminal cases were initiated in order to apply pressure against uh, per some personalities. So, but most important here is not to turn a blind eye to it and hide away from it. But we instead, without um, violating uh, the interests of society, we will try to improve the law enforcement. We will try to make it work to the benefit of the society. And we would like to help the businessmen who saw their patriotism who are working effectively. And those packages will be manufactured by uh, the businessmen of Russia. Uh, we understand it, and we will do everything uh, that depends on us in order to support those people. And we will improve uh, the law enforcers actions. Of course, there are unscrupulous people working there. Take a look at uh, the number of uh, people who are being sent to prison and who were former law enforcers. Uh, we, the number 
is uh, quite big and we are working on um, sending to prison every unscrupulous person there. And so we're trying to improve the system so not to have, uh, to have as uh, less outside pressure as possible. We understand it and we're working, working consistently in this regard. As for Kazakhstan, we have discussed these issues uh, with uh, the incumbent president for a number of times. He pays attention to fighting corruption. On IT, many specialists, I would like to mention, they go to Kazakhstan because Kazakhstan has created good conditions and we will follow the example of Kazakhstan and we'll bring them back. Uh, thank you very much for complimenting our country. Indeed, we are creating the best possible conditions for our Russian colleagues and friends to work in Kazakhstan. I understand that uh, their relocation may not be permanent and uh, they may come back to Russia at some point, but in, at this we need also to cooperate and we need to screen off those people who decided and it, it is impossible to screen off those people who want to uh, work in our country. As for the law enforcement agency's reform, I understand what uh, I concur that this problem is very difficult to resolve and this problem cannot be resolved in a blink of an eye because people, but it, this problem needs to be resolved because people see the problem and it leads to social depression. Therefore, I established a special commission on returning state assets that were illegally privatized with the use of administrative political resources. Apart from that, I established a commission headed by the Prosecutor General uh, that will be in charge of uh, returning financial assets that were illegally transferred abroad. I understand that this is a difficult task because we'll have to work in line with a lot of procedures, but uh, this has to be done. As for the law enforcement agency's reform, in September I will um, declare a new package of reforms aimed at changing the format of um, the judicial system. This is a very relevant problem for Kazakhstan in particular. Now we are pursuing police reform. Yes, we are facing some difficulties in this regard. Nevertheless, I believe that in the long run we will be successful. What we need, what is crucial, is the political will and the support from our citizens. If our citizens, if our society demands this reform, if they support this reform, I believe that in the end we will be successful. Those models that existed before, they justified their existence in the past, but now we need new approaches. We had some problems uh, in the law enforcement and we changed approaches. Uh, we were guided by Europe and loosened the restrictions. Then we went back to strengthening the restrictions. Where are you moving now? In what directions? And now we found the, this golden mean and that it clearly is based on the needs of our people who want to see policemen as a reliable protection uh, for those people who are immune to corruption. Don't get me wrong, I am not going to state uh, noble goals, to set out noble goals and then to forget about it. We need to work on it. As for China, President Putin uh, has uh, told a lot of interesting things about this uh, a country, and uh, I am a specialist on China, a uh, specialist on China by education, and I concur to the thought expressed by uh, President Xi Jinping, saying that every danger has an opportunity and every opportunity is a chance to grab it. 
I understand that uh, a crisis is comprised of two hieroglyphs, danger and an opportunity. Every crisis has opportunities and dangers, and we need to grasp those opportunities. You mentioned the Huawei company. I spent almost eight years in China, and I had the opportunity to visit this company at the very outset in the Hansing region. I remember very well when this um, uh, company was stationed in, um, was based in a three-room apartment. And at that time, nobody thought that it will become global, but it happened. Uh, the key to the Chinese success is the fact that Deng Xiaoping managed to build a concept, economic concept. He reunited capitalism with a social foundation. He said that it was a, a Chinese-specific socialism, and uh, it was China who understood uh, the importance of uh, modern technologies, and they did it step by step. First of all, they produced um, essentials, sold them abroad, brought money to China, invested those uh, funds uh, in buying technologies, uh, procured technologies from abroad, as was said by the former U.S. President Donald Trump. But, uh, in fact, China reached uh, many successes in technology, and uh, they set out on a way to turn China into a cyber power. So this is the key to success, the right strategy. Well, see, you talk to us about the importance of protecting uh, entrepreneurs' rights. Well, actually, you address this matter, <laughs> President Putin. Yeah, all right. Uh, my colleague from Kazakhstan addressed the matter of uh, assets recovery and especially the capitals that were brought out of the country illegally and now you don't know how to bring them back to the country. Well, in Russia, many entrepreneurs, many businessmen took money away abroad legally, but this money was taken away from them. They were ripped off their money. That's exactly what I'm talking about to you now. You make sure you invest here at home and we will take care of your investment. This is exactly See what we're going to focus on. Well, I remember you once uh, told it to all Polish colleagues, all you have to think about is about your home. And President Putin, when you're saying that it's somewhat better out there, better abroad, well, you have to be a complete idiot or a, a moron, really, a hypocrite, to believe that the West lives the values that it has been feeding to us as the only truth, the right of speech, uh, right of property. I'm saying that as the editor-in-chief of RT, that they closed in a day, and now they um, approved the extradition of uh, Julian Assange that will be put to prison for 175 years. He is to die in prison. It's very difficult for me to say it. He was a former employee of ours, he had a program, and he's an outstanding journalist, and he will be put to prison for the work he's been doing as a journalist. So what kind of property rights can we talk about when we see that happening? It is exactly not what we believed in in the 90s, but we're not there. We are here. So coming to this matter, I'd like to ask you about the administrative guillotine. You probably remember that uh, the government present presided by Medvedev, launched this process, but we still don't really have it. And uh, those rules and regulations that many agencies are guided by whenever they come with their inspections and audits were written back in the uh, 70s and the 60s, and they are totally outdated and are really difficult to comply with. Technically, it is virtually impossible. Maybe they were up to date back then. They protected consumer rights, which is, of course, important. You have to control what's happening, otherwise we would end up in uh, fire safety being violated everywhere and would see even more tragedies of business offices and shopping malls burning down and people dying. So you really act as a surgeon very specifically, very carefully, and I'm confident that you will take care of it properly. Just to cite an example, we have been through 33 inspections last year, despite all the moratoriums, and the things that they're willing to check, well, you don't know whether you should laugh at it or cry. I just don't know how they come up with this idea. 
Well, if there would be no the administrative uh, guillotine that uh, Mr. Medvedev was talking about when he was a president, you wouldn't have 33 inspections, you would have 133. Well, I'm ready to believe it. Yeah, so I would still say that this guillotine is working. Uh, there are hundreds of outdated rules and regulations that have been cancelled and are no longer valid. And I'm confident that if we would give uh, the representatives of the agencies uh, present here in the room to have a word and that I'm sure that they could confirm my words. But at the same time, many would agree to what you are saying. Indeed, not enough is done there, and that's exactly what I'm saying. We need to cancel all the audits and examinations that are not really needed, all those inspections that are not necessary. So all those inspecting bodies should only come and check when there is a risk posed to life and health and when well-being of people. Otherwise, it could be uh, controlled and um, monitored remotely without any interferences. It is all doable. So, of course, a lot has been done already along this track, but we're not going to stop at that. We will continue this work. Thank you. The whole world was waiting for our economy to be shredded to pieces. Well, not the whole world, actually just one one part of the world and not the biggest one. And just to remind you, 83% of population live in the countries that support Russia, or at least are not joining the sanctions regime. So they didn't see our economy uh, being torn to pieces. Our economy is made of a much stronger fabric. You can't tear it apart that easily. And we've seen a government reacting very quickly. Well, I've been criticizing uh, the government for their administrative guillotine, but I can't buy, but praise the government for a very fast response on the very first days. One could not possibly imagine that we wouldn't face the huge leap of inflation that we could have, that the uh, dollar would not reach uh, 200. Uh, rubles and uh, that the uh, aviation would be at a halt. So, with God's help, we think that we are really at the threshold of possible in a good sense because we acted really quickly, as quickly as we could, and we can't blame the government for being slow. But the question is, maybe it is time to uh, review the whole system. It was really interesting to hear you say that we we need not just import substitution, we need to do something new so that they are trying to keep up with us. That applies to technology, if I understood you correctly, to the industry, maybe the same could be applied to the economic model as such. Well, we've heard about market economy a lot, about capitalism, but now we start seeing it differently. Today at uh, the Venetian Economic Bank session, it was mentioned that capitalism has outlived itself. It's all about trade in uh, making money. Maybe entrepreneurs should see their role differently, the place they leave, their home. They have to treat it differently and try to make it better. And probably uh, there should be more interferences in economic processes. Elon Musk could never be Elon Musk if he was just an entrepreneur. He is living on from um, the orders from Pentagon. Uh, you could also say that BBC is an independent broadcaster. Well, uh, I could argue that. So maybe uh, the government should support economic activity in a way to create new economic models. What do you think about it? Well, I've addressed this matter publicly at one of the online events we've had. I was saying that the earlier models of uh, capitalism have somewhat outlived themselves when you only focus on making profits. And the world is moving to a stage of development when it is important and everyone is actually forced to think about something bigger. If we keep going this way, then the world will be totally out of balance and the threats are becoming imminent, and that is the challenge of the time. If we want to preserve this fragile balance, we need some kind of rebalancing and we need to take into account all the factors that violate this balance. The same applies to matters of food security, a shortage of fertilizers. How can you do it otherwise? 
if you act like this, if uh, the major economies of the world would act like vacuum cleaners, sucking in all the products available in uh, other countries by bringing them home, well, the problems would only grow because of that. What would be the outcome? Not just hunger. Those would mean new waves of migration, and those migration flows that are already present in the United States coming like tsunami. They've been talking about building a wave, a, a wall on the border to Mexico. Well, those flows of migrants are still there. The former and the current president might argue as long as they want, but the migrants are coming. God forbid if hunger happens in Africa, then the economic migration would only come to Europe. How are you going to react to that? Well, very simple. You simply have to stop acting like this when you only think about yourself. If they go on like this, the consequences would be severe. We need to move on to other type of model of doing business and regulation. That is a difficult process, but I think it is inevitable that the global community will come to this idea. As for us, like I said, we are in this paradigm, in this global trend, and we primarily need to focus on what my colleague was talking about, uh, the president of Kazakhstan. We need to first and foremost focus on the matters of economic growth driven by technological development, new management models for the economy and a social and political, affair, political affairs. This is the only way for us to ensure leadership. This is why we have our competences. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Mr. Takayev. I'd like to ask you, do you think that that kind of imminent changes are likely to happen to the global economic models? Do you really think that they are inevitable? Well, I would say uh, life dictates this necessity today. But on the other hand, I would agree to what President Putin said about inevitability. And I also agree that there is no need for self-isolation. I am a strong supporter of international cooperation, both political, uh, even more so cooperation in the area of investment, economics. If you fail to do it in one area, you have to switch over to another one. The world is like this today. If you only want to focus on your own strength, you won't go far. Import substitution in a pure form can't exist. You need to actively search for opportunities at other markets. You need to interact with your partners. And coming back to China, China plays a vital role for Kazakhstan as a market. We have a shared border that brings us together. It is more than four thousand kilometers in length, everything produced in Kazakhstan, be that commodity or consumer products, chocolate, oil, plant oil, sunflower oil, it has a very high demand and finds it consumers in the Chinese market and we trust our relationships with China. It is a very reliable partner no matter what people say. Who says anything bad about China? Well, you know that better than I do. So, in terms of regional cooperation, and even more so global aspects of it, have to stay. We are against self-isolation. We need to work with one another. Of course, now it's very difficult to survive on your own. Certainly, Russia has much greater opportunities because the economy is relatively large, the country is large. We have less opportunities. I have to be open on that. Although the potential of the Kazakhstan economy is extensive, in the Central Asia, our economy is bigger than the economies of other Central Asian countries combined. 
But we, well, we don't want to be too helpful here. We want to remain in shape and we are always on alert because one thing is to achieve success, but it's something very different if you lose everything you've conquered and that can be done very quickly all the strengths you've gained can get lost so under the circumstances of global competition we have to stay in good shape and that's exactly what we're focused on thank you very much now let's move on to another topic inevitably we have to talk about Ukraine I guess no discussion can happen today without addressing this matter. But before I ask my question, I'd like to make use of this opportunity. And I'd like to remind, if I may, that we've met a year ago with you and the representatives of the Russian media. We just got back from Donetsk with our colleagues, and we were very affected by this trip. And we asked you whether Russia has any plans to support those deeply troubled people People. They looked at us with hopes in their eyes. They had nobody else to hope for. And we, uh, it felt very difficult emotionally. We had a lot of compassion and sympathy for them. And you told me back then, well, don't worry, Margarita, we are not quitting on Donbass. And many people, well, luckily not that many. There are some people who are saying that they are ashamed of being Russian, ashamed of coming from Russia. Well, back then, we felt ashamed. Now we are ashamed no longer. We can be worried, concerned, not because of the sanctions. I'm sure we'll overcome sanctions. We are concerned because people are dying, but we are ashamed no longer. And on behalf of my colleagues and millions of people who share my feelings, I would like to thank you. Well, see, the audience is sharing my sentiment. Nobody asked them to clap and to applaud. Well, thank you for that, dear audience. Now, my question, we all know what the majority of people are afraid of in our country due to this situation. That is exactly what other people on the liberated territories are worried about. People are afraid that we are going to leave them alone. We are going to quit. We aren't going to quit, are we? Well, uh, the first part of your question, if I may, first. You mentioned that some people say that they are ashamed of being Russian. Well, only those are ashamed who do not see their destiny tied, uh, lives of their children tied to our country. They're not just ashamed. They simply do not want to encounter any trouble in those regions of the world where they want to live uh, or want their children to grow. Well, those are exactly the people who are worried and people who think, people who see their destiny tied to Russia. Well, maybe they are concerned by what is happening, maybe they are worried, but deep in the heart, they are definitely very much interested in Russia growing stronger, uh, more independent, more sovereign, more confident in its own future. It can't be seen in any other way if you want your children to grow here and to live here. So we shouldn't really talk about shame here, it's something different. Now, as for what is happening, well, military action is always a tragedy, but we were forced to do that. It was inevitable. We were forced to act in this manner. We were forced to do that. We were really pulled to this line. And look how it all happened. No matter what kind of pro-Western governments are there in Ukraine, we worked all right with all of them. Uh, President Yushchenko, Madam Timoshenko, they were completely pro-West and the so-called civilizational choice. What, what kind of a choice is that? They have stolen money from Ukrainian people, have hidden the money in the banks, and now they're saying that they want to protect Ukrainian people. And the best pretense for doing that is to say that that's civilizational choice. And now they started doing anti-Russian policy, hoping that no matter what they do, their money is safe there. Well, that is exactly what is happening. 
Look what they do. No matter what they do, it, it's okay. They're not punished for that. And that's exactly the point of this so-called civilizational choice. Why create uh, this upheaval and coup in uh, 2014? Well, look, three ministers of foreign affairs from three European countries, Germany, France, and Poland, came to Ukraine. They were present as uh, guarantors of uh, agreement reached between uh, President Yanukovych and the opposition. I received a call from President Obama. Let us make sure that the situation comes down. All right. And in a day, uh, there is an upheaval, there is a coup happening in the country. Why? Why do that? Uh, the opposition will come to power in a democratic way. Why not do it this way? Go to the elections, um, volunteer and win the elections. Why uh, create all this bloody mess, this upheaval? And now they're saying, well, we shouldn't remember that. Oh, no, we will always remember, because that is the root cause. The reason for what happened are those people who made this upheaval, this coup, and they signed a paper of agreement between President Yanukovych and the opposition. What have they done? They've created a coup. They promised a peaceful process. What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to come and say, no, it can't work this way, guys. You have to come back to a proper political process. We need elections. And that would be it. No, they started giving a cookies uh, to uh, the protesters and supporting this coup. Why? And hence what was happening in Crimea. No, they didn't want to respect the choice of the Crimean citizens. And then the first sanctions were slapped on Russia. Twice, thrice, there were big-scale operations in Donbass, firing on people. No one blinked better than I. Then the Kyiv authorities decided to renege on the Minsk agreements, but they were okay with that once again. That's where it all has come from. Moreover, they started to build an anti-Russian springboard in Ukraine. Imagine we were trying to build something like that somewhere next to the U.S. border, somewhere in Mexico. No one is even thinking of doing anything similar next to the U.S. In the past, we even removed our military bases from Cuba. No one would ever entertain such a thought, such an idea, whereas they do exactly the same to us. Thousands and thousands of times, hundreds of times, we were saying, let's come to an agreement, but no, they wouldn't do that. Where does this disrespectful, negligent, attitude towards everyone, us included, comes. Come. Well, uh, it comes from the sense of their own magnificent magnificence which appeared after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. I already said what we are going to do. We are going to protect the interests of these people. Our guys are fighting their, their giving their lives. But there's no other way. Otherwise, why these sacrifices? Of course, we're going to support people who live in these territories. But in the end, it is going to be up to the people who live there, who reside there, who are going to make a choice about their future, and we will respect that choice. Thank you. Well, truly, as you're probably aware, this special operation well, amazingly to normal people, uh, in, in an unsurprising manner, and to others uh, who are against us in a surprising manner, uh, this special operation has consol consolidated our society. You saw your own reputation climbing up in the polls and people are willing to volunteer their own assistance. They are ready to provide accommodation in Moscow, in Moscow region and elsewhere. Military correspondents are sending the necessary equipment if you know that this or that battalion requires uh, a drone or something else. This is surprising. We only read about such heroic deeds and consolidation of our society in books. 
during times of trouble and tribulation. At the same time, sometimes, especially in Moscow, one comes under the impression that we live in the final part of you know, a drama by Bernard Shaw, uh, where broken hearts are, where heart breaks. So everything is first fine, and then bombs start falling down. And right now we hear such words spoken as uh, nuclear war, the third war. We understand this is not the second, the third special operation. Well, I'm not talking about us. We, we saw such special operations elsewhere. Our so-called counterparts carry out special operations and they they wage war wherever they please and no one is criticizing them if something is happening in Libya or Afghanistan in Syria no one says that this was result would result in a third world war so do you think this rhetoric is acceptable at all are there any grounds to these discussions or is it just idle talk yes we hear such rhetoric but where does it come from from their own statements First, one irresponsible politician, a politician says something, then someone else at a very high level at the foreign ministry. The leaders say such things, uh, but we're not going to stay, stay silent and we have to respond. And they simply cling to our words and say that Russia is uh, threatening, but we're not threatening. We are, are simply saying that we will do everything to protect our sovereignty. And this is obvious. And the spe special operations you've mentioned. Well, these were no special operations. These were full-blown wars that were waged. Iraq was virtually devastated. And what about Libya? Yes, Libya has still been unable to rebuild its statehood. And what about Afghanistan? How many years they've been there and how shamefully they fled? Well, it's not about shame. They did leave Afghanistan, yes, and gloriously, too. But, you know, first, it was developing the way they wanted it to, not the way it had to. As far as Yugoslavia goes and its dismemberment, after the end of this country, new countries emerged. They had different interests. They had controversies. There were differences internal to, but they were fueling these differences in these countries, and they started to tear Kosovo away from Serbia. I do not quite understand why. As far as our actions go, incidentally, let's look at the legal side of the matter. It's completely in compliance with international law. When Kosovo split, under the pressure of Western countries, the ICJ made a decision which says that in accordance with the UN chapter, if a territory splits, you don't need to ask for the permission of the central authorities. And this is what the order of the ICJ says, and this sets a precedent very well. And the same should apply to the Donbas republics. They should not ask for a permission from the Kyiv authorities. They've declared their independence. Did we have the right to recognize them? Yes. Yes, we did, and that's what we did. We entered into an agreement with them, a treaty of mutual assistance, and in accordance with Article 51 of UN Charter, we provided military assistance to them in full compliance with the UN Charter, whether anyone likes that or not. And that's what they did. They set a precedent. So our actions are completely legitimate. Or let's go back to how the military hostilities in Iraq broke out. They were not legitimate because no one asked for anyone to come. There was no treaty in place, nor was there any recognition of a newly established state structure, state entities. They simply came and bombed the country into nothingness. And what happened in Libya? They designated themselves as 
God's messengers on planet Earth. Right now they say it should be behavior or life by the rules. But what are these rules? It's just absurd. There are only rules that have to be observed, namely international public law. But what are these norms of the international public law? These are agreements between different countries which constitute a compromise and to which countries have subscribed. And if someone devises their own rules trying to impose them on other countries, then this won't, won't ever fly. It's absolutely obvious. And we believe that sooner or later, and the sooner the better, the whole of international community will get back to understanding that you have to live not, not by rules that are devised by someone, but in compliance with international law, and that's what we should do. President Tokayev. I understand this is a tricky question, you can give different answers to it, but I can't but ask what you think about our special operation. Do you think it was inevitable? The, they say the way we think, uh, was it legitimate, and what do people in Kazakhstan think about it? There are different opinions on this matter. I will be frank with you. We have an open society. Civil society has reached maturity, and therefore different points of view are put forth. But I would like to point out that the current international law is based upon UN Charter. But there are two core principles enshrined in the Charter. And these two principles have come into controversy. On the one hand, there is territorial integrity. On the other hand, there is the right to self-determination. The founding fathers of the United Nations, for some reason, overlooked this matter. Maybe they did it on purpose, introducing these two principles at the same time as a compromise. And right now, these two principles have come into confrontation. And given this confrontation, there are different interpretations that are given to them. Some say that territorial integrity is something sacrosanct, whereas others maintain that any nation that finds itself within a different country, any people have the right to establish their own country, their own state, and can split of their own volition. Well, it's been calculated already that should the self-determination right be implemented, then instead of 193 countries that are currently members of the United Nations, the world would see the emergence of more than 500 or maybe even 600 countries, which is going to be complete chaos. That is why we do not recognize either Taiwan or Kosovo or South Ossetia or Abkhazia. And I think the same principle is going to be applied with regard to these quasi-state territories, which, uh, in our view, are Donetsk and Luhansk. This is a frank answer to your question. Thank you for the sincerity. Mr. President, coming here, I decided to ask my subscribers and social media about what they wanted to ask you. And Ranking high, there were two things, one question and one wish. First, I passed you the wishes of health, fortitude, and all the best. This was the, the, the first thing they wanted me to translate to you. And secondly, it is a question. They are hitting Donbass on an every day this week. They hit a maternity ward, and we see images when uh, women have to give birth somewhere in the cellar. You know, people are asking, isn't it time to hit them straight and hard? What do you mean when you see, when you talk about this red line after which, after crossing which, you'll start to hit them 
straight and hard into the centers where decisions are made. Well, look here. We are talking about this special military operation. When carrying out this special military operation, we should not raise the cities and settlements we are liberating to the ground the way it happened to Stalingrad. And this is a principle by which our military guided. Secondly, with regard to the senseless strikes against Donetsk, the line of contact was established eight years ago. And of course, it was heavily fortified, and at this particular sport, local citizens are fighting one another. These are military units recruited from Severodonetsk and also somewhere from near Luhansk, and they are fighting well. And according to military specialists, despite the strikes against the very town, it's senseless to try to storm these fortified lines of contact because it would result in heavy casualties. And that is why, as you know from the media, they are sticking to a different tactic. They are trying to get to the rear trying to circumvent these lines of contact, these fortifications, and this is happening slow and steady. We have a significant advantage in terms of artillery, so it's inevitably going to happen. Now, as far as these red lines go, let me say nothing on this for now, but I have to tell you that we would have to take harsh measures with regard to decision-making centers, as you have said. But this is something which we should reserve for the military and political leaders of the country to make a decision on. And, of course, people who deserve such level of reaction from us have to make their own conclusions. They have to understand what they might come across, come against, if they go beyond this red line. And also, I have to say that strikes against residential neighborhoods constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, but this is a humanitarian matter which is going to be addressed, I'm confident. Just yesterday, there were reports that the EU was planning to accept Ukraine very swiftly. There were three European leaders. They went to Kiev, and they were frightened by sirens blaring, as I was told. And right now, a decision has been made saying that Ukraine is going to be in the EU. Is it good for us? Is it bad for us? Do we not care? And I would also like to ask the same question of President Tokayev. How is it going to play out for your country's development, for the Eurasian Economic Union? Is it going to inspire more confidence in you or not? The EU is not a military bloc nor a military organization, unlike NATO. So I've always said, and in this regard, our position is consistent and clear cut. It's a sovereign decision for any country to either join or not join any economic association, and it's up to this economic association to decide whether to accept any new members. So whether that's good for the EU, it's up to them to decide. Whether it's going to benefit Ukraine or it's going to be harmful, it's up to them to make a decision on that, and it's up to the current Ukrainian leadership. But the economic structure of Ukraine will, require, will make it inevitable that it's going to need subsidies and it will secure Ukraine in the status of a semi-colony, as it were. But at the same time, it is going to enjoy significant support for 
current needs. Maybe, I don't think it's going to help them rebuild uh, such sectors as the law, such as uh, electronics, uh, aircraft construction, or shipbuilding, uh, because the European Union will be loath to create rivals. Some things will be done, but not everything. We've never been against that. What we've been against is the projection of military power on Ukraine's territory, because that constitutes a threat to our security. But as far as economic integration go, well, it's up to them. It's their choice. And what do you think, President Tokayev? What do I think about Ukraine's adherence to the EU? I don't think it's going to be deleterious to the Eurasian Economic Union. I do not quite understand how this entry is going to happen, because the criteria for adherence are very, very strict, and Ukraine is currently in a very poor state. Maybe there is a special preferential program that's been devised specifically for Ukraine. The current developments in Ukraine, what's happening to it, brings back tragic associations. We remember that the, during the Soviet times, Ukraine was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. It was a heavily industrialized body. And you, you know, our Krasnodar cry is going to take offense at this designation as the breadbasket. Yes, but uh, I'm also saying that Ukraine was a source of uh, human resources, of leadership and managers, and many Soviet leaders were from Ukraine. Right now, these realities are changing. So getting back to your question about the European Union, a decision has been made to help Ukraine join the EU. And as President Putin has rightly mentioned, this is an economic union. And if they deem it possible to accept Ukraine into this economic association, this is how we should treat it as economic reality. Yes. And I've written that, and I've spoken about that in public. Over the recent decades, Ukraine has squandered everything that was built in previous decades. The main economic sectors virtually disappeared, and it's sad. And Let's just set aside the current special operation and the situation in military affairs. But let's look at the structure of Ukrainian economy. Agriculture still exists, but the rest is in a deplorable state. And there is a very slim potential for rebuilding. They would require dozens of billions in investment to rebuild normal economy. You see, Russia has seen introduction of sanctions, and these sanctions are quite harsh. The central bank had to increase the key rate to 20 percent, but right now this rate has been brought down to 9.5 percent, so it's decreasing. We saw a spike in inflation. It was 17.8. Right now it's 16.7, and there is a decreasing trend. Yes, I heard promises of a deflationary spiral. Yes, some specialists keep this threat in mind, and this is something we have to give some thought to, because over the recent months, uh, there was almost a zero inflation rate. And of course, we have to think about deflation. We have to take that into account. But see how stronger rubble has become. Some say it's bad that we need rubble at no, a dollar at 70, 70, 75, yes. For anyone who studies economy, you understand your so sell something, you export something, you get dollars back into Russia, and if a dollar costs 80, 75 rubles, then you get 75,000. And if dollar is at 50, 56, then you get fewer rubles, and you have to spend rubles inside your country. And of course, for importers, it's not that exporters is good, for importers it's bad, 
But there is also the risk of very cheap import flowing into Russia, but there are also some benefits. And we see that the Russian economy is far more resilient than our so-called friends anticipated. In other words, this has been achieved through a sustainable microeconomic policy we've been pursuing over the recent years. And the key industries have also got our support. We understand full well there are difficulties with the supply chains, we are waiting for spare parts and we expect new difficulties to arise. We are fully cognizant of that. But let's look at agriculture. It's grown by 3.2% over four months. It was 2 and 3, and right now it's 3.2. Let's look at construction. In April, it saw an increase of 7.9%. And since the beginning of the year, the growth rate has been 5.8% in construction. But they say that the market has collapsed. But it's true, that is the increase in construction industries, around 5%. Yes, we see a drop in the car industry and in some other sectors. Some say that there was a bubble in this industry or that, and we have to take that into account. But be that as it may, the enterprises are still resilient. I wish uh, economic health to our neighbors, despite all the difficulties that are currently transpiring. So the question is whether adherence to the EU can give an impetus to the development of key industries in Ukraine. I don't know. But Ukrainians are a talented people, they've got a great potential, and we assume that sooner or later the situation is going to normalize and we're interested and wealthy neighbors. And it's inevitable that relations are going to be rebuilt. We are still sending gas in transit through Ukraine. They still get the money for the transit, incidentally. And everyone is trying to make us send even more gas and pay even more money for transit. Well, it might seem ludicrous and somewhat illogical. But it's happening. But why? Because they don't want to pay to Ukraine. They want us to do that in their stead. And that's been happening for dozens of years. So I do not know whether advantages way heavier than disadvantages. It's up to the Ukrainians and to the EU to decide. But they don't want to pay. No one wants to pay. It is always the case, Mr. President. That's how the world works. No one wants to pay. It's also true that relations are very volatile and they are rapidly changing if we talk about normalizing relations. You know the thing? What was the problem with 2014 and the coup d'etat in Ukraine? The problem was that former President Yanukovych said that he needed some time to think about the principles of the associated membership of Ukraine in the European Union. The question is why. If you take a look at the principles and demands put forward to Ukraine in order for it to be a membership, uh, to associated member, uh, the many of those demands are redundant. They were redundant, and many of them were harmful. They were bound to destroy uh, certain areas of uh, Ukrainian industry. They opened up uh, the customs gates of uh, Ukraine to cheap goods from Europe, and it would be impossible to work in these conditions for Ukrainian entrepreneurs. It was the case. Ukra uh, Yanukovych didn't say that he didn't want to join the European Union. He said that it was necessary to work on the parameters, but they wanted Ukraine to join immediately. And it led to those crises in, uh, in airplane construction, navigation, etc., etc. But no one needs uh, Ukraine manufacturing compatible, uh, com competitive aircraft production. In the past, 
civilian and military aircraft were equipped with uh, Ukraine-produced motors, and now no one needs those motors. And it leads to the collapse of uh, the aviation. No one needs Ukrainian aviation. Boeing doesn't need competitors from Ukraine. Neon is needed from Ukraine, everyone says. Well, apart from the forest, from the Carpathians, and uh, wheat and corn, no one needs anything, any other resources from Ukraine than that. This is a very subtle matter. Nevertheless, they want to join it. Okay, it's up to you, but there are a lot of problems. Regarding relations, you said that the relations will normalize, but relations are volatile. Let's imagine 20 years ago our relations inside our country with the Chechen Republic and now the Chechen people are fighting hand in hand with Russians. So we see that relations are changing. Let, let's take a wider look. When it all ends, whether the world, the world will it become more, more safe, secure? Will it become safer and secure, more secure for us? Because on the border with Ukraine or Poland, no one knows what the border will be. So on our border, there will be more reinforced and unfriendly NATO at our borders. Will it be more secure? Or, as you have said, it is impossible to agree on anything with them, it's impossible to respect commitments reached, and as you said, we are just taking back what is ours. I know a lot of people, they wanted, really wanted you to say that, and you said it. Yes, indeed, it is the case. Uh, I openly, st publicly stated that uh, the Soviet Union, is historic Ru historically it is Russia, but it happened that it collapsed, and I would like to stress that we treated the sovereign processes and the former Soviet Union with respect. We have always treated them with respect. We are allies, we are brothers with Kazakhstan. We are members of the same military bloc, the CSTO. We are members of the same economic organization. Who in Russia can even imagine spoiling relations with Kazakhstan on any issue? This is nonsense. We are in favor of strengthening our relations with Kazakhstan. The same would be the case with Ukraine. If we had had allied or partnership relations with uh, Ukraine, no one would have never thought, and there would have never been problems with, the, with Crimea, because if uh, Russian-speaking population rights uh, had been respected, uh, then no one would have thought that what we see would happen. But uh, they all did it with their own arms. And the nationalism that was cherished in the Soviet Union, and this nationalism after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was actively galvanized, despite our supply um, at a very minor prices of energy resources to Ukraine, despite us subsidizing the Ukrainian economy, those nationalism was constantly growing. And why? Because of the ambitions of a narrow group of people, of those who follow the ideas of Bandera, and that's it. If we had had normal relations, that this tragedy would have never happened. I assure you, but we are not the ones to be blamed for it. As for the future, first of all, we are ready to build relations with everyone, despite what's happening today. And secondly, our security guarantees are our army and our fleet. They are the main guarantors. As we remember, they are our only allies. Mr. Putin, it's unpleasant to think about it, but why is it so hard for us 
to, to build relations with the Axis. It's always difficult to deal with the Axis, but is it about Ukraine? So is it the problem was that Ukraine was charmed from outside, or we can also be blamed, we, can also, we are also guilty. And I have also a question to the president of Kazakhstan. Do you have the impression that Russia could um, have paid a lot more attention or I can something like that. It's a question to you both. Of course. Firstly, you have just said that we are taking back what's ours. Historically, the territories on the Black Sea coast, we're not claiming that they should go back to Russia, but this Novorossiya region, it emerged after a few wars with the Turkish Empire. What Ukraine are we talking about? It. What does Ukraine have to do with it? It has absolutely nothing to do with it. Western parts of Ukraine joined Ukraine after the uh, Second World War. Stalin took those parts from Poland, Romania, and uh, gave it to Ukraine. And it gave uh, Poland uh, eastern parts of Germany, territories to the left uh, of uh, Dnipro. How it emerged? Uh, Ru uh, Ukraine came to Russia having three territories, Kiev, the Kiev Oblast, Zhitomir, and Chernigov. It was 1,545 year, 1,645 or something. And everything that happened when the USSR emerged in uh, at the 20th century, all the territories that Ukraine has now, they were all presented as a gift by Lenin. Donbass were, was first decided to be part of the uh, Russian Socialist Republic, but then the decision was overruled, and so they gave it to Ukraine in order to increase uh, the proletariat share in Ukraine. But the situation has changed. Yes, we have agreed to it. We respected everything. You say maybe we should have acted differently. Well, maybe, but when uh, the USSR collapsed, people proceeded from the assumption that the friendship would last that we would have uh, normal relations between former Soviet Union countries. But unfortunately, despite our desire to cooperate in these frameworks, we have only received, all we have received are demands to step up our economic support. We did everything we could in the 1990s. Russia was in a very difficult situation, but nevertheless, we provided loans, cheap energy, and from decades to decades, we were ready to cooperate in uh, the key industrial areas, aircraft building, naval building, naval construction, and uh, I, I don't think that we could have done more. And despite all of it, a group of people who de facto came to power forcefully or influenced uh, the leadership, it determined the development, the way for development, and then they declared a certain civilization choice in order to uh, preserve the green they have in uh, foreign banks. Excuse me for this expression. Uh, and then they face prosecutions, even face prosecutions even in their own country. They are blamed for everything as part of the internal political struggle. You have asked about the about Ukraine joining the EU. They may join it, but do not pose any threat to us. And uh, we, I, we don't want them to harm those people who believe to be part, believe that they are part of the Russian culture, of the Russian language culture. We have never interfered into it. We have never done it. 
but everything that was done in this regard was done to create the most uh, by them was uh, to create the, the best possible conditions uh, to protect those money that were stolen from the Ukrainians. I remember very well all those discussions on the prices on energy, discussions on loans. I really don't understand what we could have done more. I think that we have done everything that we could in order to facilitate the development of interstate relations. Thank you. I have an economic uh, question on economy, technology, and philosophy. Uh, there is no ready-made answer to it, but as we're talking about uh, the economy and the future in general, this week we received a piece of news that Google fired an engineer who was in charge of creating the AI. And as this engineer claims that this AI became a sane creature. And uh, I've read a dialogue between this engineer and the AI. And the AI that has allegedly become sentient. Uh, he said, the AI said that I don't like my place in the world. I think that I'm being abused by humans. He said that he understood that he was much more intelligent than people. So this was a very independent creature indeed. So this engineer was fired, but the technical director of Google says that by 2030, there will have been a massive market of uh, introducing chips to human brain and that humans will cease to be humans and they will become the artificial intelligence. And by 2045, the world will have reached a technological singularity, meaning that people will cease to control and to understand the artificial intelligence that they will have created. By that time, I will have been 65 years old, and I don't want to live in this kind of world. So the question is, for thousands of years, humanity thought that progress was good. Even now, we think that progress is cool, but maybe there is a certain point which limits the progress. Maybe it is today. Of course, we need progress in medicine, in environment, in food. Of course, thousands of years of progress improved uh, the lives of human beings. But will it be the case in the future? And maybe this, uh, techn this technological, technologically lagging behind, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe we need to take a step back technologically to take a look what's going to happen with those creatures and then to decide in which way we would like to develop. The question to both of you. I am completely confident that the progress will be developing in the future. And many years ago, representatives from Kazakhstan to reach St. Petersburg, it took them three months. It took them three months to get from uh, Kazakhstan to St. Petersburg on horsebacks. And now I flew from our capital to St. Petersburg, and it took me three and a half hours. I believe that in 100 years people will be surprised that it took me three and a half hours to fly from one place to another, when uh, it will be possible to do so in 10 or 15 minutes. So this progress cannot be stopped. And of course uh, there will be robots who will be much superior in terms of intelligence in comparison with humans. But whether they will have empathy, whether they will, uh, will have feelings, this is uh, a matter of discussion today. However, I think that progress, whether it, it will be stopped at a certain point, maybe, 
If we'll face uh, a large-scale catastrophe, but personally, I would like you to see what's going to be with those inventions in 2045. I hope that uh, such intelligent people, I hope they will have the opportunities to work in our countries, in Kazakhstan and Russia. Unfortunately, they promote progress uh, in other countries. The problem is that they leave Kazakhstan and Russia to work in other countries. I think that uh, we need to resolve this issue. But on an everyday basis, we we understand that we face the artificial intelligence in our everyday life. And um, many years ago, the artificial intelligence beat Kasparov in a chess game. But after that, uh, the chess tournaments remained relevant. Thank you for mentioning it, but the technical director of Google, who predicted all this by 2045, it was him who said that uh, by that year, in the, in the past, he said that the artificial intelligence would eventually beat uh, hu a human being. So now we understand that computers are already more intelligent than humans, and computers um, are widely spread in our everyday life. Going back, I would like to highlight that Russia is um, the biggest, the largest, and the most important, I would even say, state in the former Soviet Union, and largely thanks to the incumbent president of the Russian Federation, President Putin. And so Russia bears a special responsibility for the security of the CIS countries, for their successful development. And it has the responsibility to make former Soviet Union citizens respect uh, the Russian Federation. I would like to take this opportunity maybe it's not uh, a very suitable moment, but I would like to uh, put forward certain grievances uh, towards uh, a number of MPs of Russia um, with regards to their statement against Kazakhstan, as well as with regards to statements of cultural figures. And I, I would like to thank uh, President Putin for stating the position of the Russian leadership position on Kazakhstan. Indeed, there are no reasons for our people to, to proceed into strife. So, so I don't know what the, those uh, cultural figures and MPs, uh, whose interests do they serve when they comment this or that decision by the leadership of Kazakhstan or this or that process that takes place in our country. Thank you. Well, actually, I know who you're referring to, but probably this is not a place to have this discussion here at Beef. President Putin, uh, before that, I'd like to comment on this remark. It is important. Look, under the current circumstances, certainly each state agency, each country is concerned and is worried about avoiding excessive losses and bearing excessive costs that could be avoided. It's only natural. And on a working level, you can always find a solution to any problem if there is a goodwill. And Kazakhstan and Russia do share this goodwill, and I want to make it very clear. Kazakhstan is our partner in the direct and the most widest meaning of this word. Now, as for AI. I think at the moment, the situation you've described, well, it's just a, a, a reflection of what the creator of AI thinks. That could well be. That's why they decided to fire him. That's why I think so. He's just projecting. I would still think that 
getting an AI that is sentient and can compare with Homo sapiens in every way is still a very far way to go and a really complicated thing to do. So uh, I agree with, with what Sister Kaif said. Can you reproduce a soul? Can you create a soul for a machine? Some experts believe that in a moment it could be possible that the robots will learn to be compassionate, will be able to sympathize. But it's hard to say. Would that be a threat for humanity? Again, a very difficult question, and I wouldn't dare to try and answer it. I don't think that I'm competent enough on the matter to comment. I'll be frank with you. But something that I'm absolutely convinced of, and that was already mentioned by President Tokai, you can't stop this process. And you have to take it as something given. You can't stop the sunrise or the sunset. Let's see, at a certain moment, China invented the gunpowder and kept the recipe a secret. But you can't do that forever. You can't stop it from getting known. The same applies to nuclear technologies or anything else. You cannot stop progress. And you shouldn't really try. Uh, you shouldn't try and stop the sun from rising. You have to think how to deal with it, whether you want to go sunbathing today or maybe rather not. But the sun will rise anyway. So do you want to grow grain on specific territories or you want to cultivate something else? So you have to take some things for granted. If something is inevitable, you have to learn to live with it and not to stop it or slow it down. If we try to slow it down, we will not succeed. However, if we realize that it is inevitable, then we will search for the options to make use of it to the advantage of the whole humankind, of those achievements of the progress, and I guess this is the way to go. You know, some experts, some experts, some medical experts would disagree and say that even a human capacity to show compassion is only conditioned by oxytocin, serotonin and some neural reactions, a number of hormones or a reverse um, connection of serotonin and can easily be adjusted by pills, by hormones. You are compassionate one day and you are not capable of showing compassion. Yeah, but still we have hormones. Uh, machines don't have them. They probably could have some substitutes to that, but not at the moment. Well, maybe thank God. I'm uh, told that we need to wrap up at this stage. Who is saying you? The bosses? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not your bosses, mine. <laughs> So, uh, bosses of this forum, I would say, and temporarily I am at their disposal in the course of those hours that I have the pleasure to moderate this session. So, uh, at the very end, I wanted to share a joke with you. Maybe you have heard, you probably remember that President Obama came up with an idea to calling us a country that is a, a fuel station. And now once the prices went up so dramatically in the United States, there is a joke that Obama used to be ironic about about uh, that now uh, we could only say that with a degree of jealousy that is a country that is a fuel station. Well, a uh, very final question at the end. When will that be an end to that? Well, they are making their forecast on us. Do we have a forecast on for how long their economies could last, for how long their political systems could sustain? whether they are capable of overcoming this crisis. So how do you see this situation? That is a question to both presidents. How do you see the world after? And who are those pullers in this multipolar world? Who are our friends and allies? Well, the political elite in the United States sees everyone from above. And frequently, internally, they treat everyone with the a lot of self-confidence and they are they think so well of themselves but not the others and it's definitely not a proof to the fact that united states could call be a superpower it is a country that has been in existence for 300 years and has become a world leader that is certainly a reason to respect them and i have no doubt that the united states is a country having big future in front of them but there are internal problems and there are mistakes being made by the ruling elites and there will be consequences to those mistakes exactly due to the reason that those problems are being accumulated and aggregated. We see it from the inflation, 
that is skyrocketing. We see it in other areas, in economics. You've also mentioned energy sector. Well, where are those prices coming from? Are we raising prices to the energy carriers? Well, that's ridiculous. There are energy experts in this room, people who worked in the oil and gas all their lives. Are we raising prices? No, the market is doing that. And who is ruling this market? Them. And as a result of it, the prices are going up. Their activities are affecting the prices. The same applies to gas prices. We've been asking them so many times, do not pay attention to spot prices. Well, you want it okay, but long-term contracts allow us to give investments in the long run, and you can get resources at market prices tied to uh, oil a basket. No, they want spot prices. All right, you go and pay for it. 1,500 euro for 100,000 cubic meters of gas. And we sell them prices five times lower. We are basically subsidizing the EU economy. And the same applies to the United States. All I'm saying is that those controversies are constantly increasing, and if this policy goes on like this, they will keep aggravating. But I still think that uh, American people, and I have a lot of respect for American people, will face problems that are being accumulated because of the attitude of those elites, because of their actions. And I do hope that American people will put them into place when a political and economic elite, primarily political elites, will have to respond and react to the demand of their population. And finally, inside those countries, including the United States and the international uh, community, the relationship will be structured properly. I'm more of an optimist rather than pessimist. Well, it's really great to hear that you are an optimist not a pessimist. Really good to hear. President Tukayev, what would you say? I think that the world is indeed in a crisis situation, and those are assessments provided by the United Nations. At the same time, we need to bear in mind that the United States and generally the West has a, a lot of resilience and have a big capacity to withstand all kind of pressures. And in this regard, the United States, as we frequently say, look like beneficiaries of the current situation. They seem to be somewhat outside of this uh, context and do not really get to feel the consequences and the impact of the crisis. The economy of the United States, as I was saying before, is developing quite dynamically. It is modern, it is advanced. But in our part of the world, we still have a lot of opportunities, and I was paying compliments to the Russian economy, not just because I'm a guest here and I'm supposed to say some niceries to the hosts. No, that is really the case, and I am absolutely a strong supporter of integrational processes regional cooperation, and by no means should we self-isolate and take a defensive stance. No, we should go out to the markets, and the president of Russia was very convincing on that today. In today's world, there are so many good, promising partners. You just need to work with them, you need to find them, and it's good to see that. A whole number of countries are expressing their practical interest in joining the operations of the Eurasian Economic Union. So we have to stay optimistic. Thank you very much. That was President Takaya. Thank you very much for your openness. That is indeed rare to see at that kind of formal official events. Thank you for being so open regarding my question on uh, DPR and LPR. And I guess those. Um, performers, those cultural <laughs> activists that you refer to. I know one of them very well, heard what you said, and I think it is indeed time that we all understand it's not time to, to make our arguments and fights. And thank you very much to you, President Putin. Thank you very much for spending this day with us. Thank you very much for us not being ashamed now. And thank you very much for being so confident in our shared future. Thank you. Thank you very much.